Oh, thank you very much, folks, and uh, welcome to everybody that's here. Uh, certainly welcome to all the folks that are watching online, and uh, delighted to be here. And as David said, uh, the 5D Mark IV was announced a while back, so most of you folks who are interested, some of you even may have bought the camera up to, at, at this point, but most of you folks who are interested in it know the basic specs and so on, so we're not going to go too deep into trying to explain what 30 million pixels is and that kind of thing. But what we are going to do is try to give you some insights into some of the features, give you a better look at them, give you an idea of some of the image capabilities of the camera, some of the tools within the camera. And then for those of you who haven't made the switch, answer some questions in terms of, is this the right camera for you? And compare and contrast it to other cameras in the line to see if it's the right fit for you or not. Uh, we have 11 different models in the EO system at present. Obviously, not every one is the right camera for everybody. Uh, so without further ado, David uh, struck an interesting chord there a moment ago when he talked about just the history of the 5D series. And it's been a very interesting series. Uh, there's no question, EOS 5D has become something of not just a flagship product for Canon, but really a very important product in the, in the history of digital SLR photography, a uh, very signature product uh, as we've moved from the first 5D back in 2005 to where we are today. As I said, you know the main primary features of the camera, and certainly we'll touch on some of these, but our purpose here isn't to introduce it as though you had not heard about this camera before. But our purpose is to get you a deeper look inside. So we'll highlight some of these features. Uh, we'll look at some of the images of the camera and talk about some of the image characteristics of it to give you a little better idea of what the camera is capable of. We'll look at its video features and talk about them. And then, as I said, we'll sum up by looking at if you're considering stepping up to this camera, what are some of the benefits going to be if you're coming from another model in the EOS system? and compare it to other products currently in the line. So let's start with taking a little bit more of a look at what is new. And I guess the place to start first would be the fact that we've got a 30.4 million pixel CMOS sensor. And just to put the numbers in perspective, I think you know, as, as an industry, we're often guilty of basically throwing numbers out there. And it gets to a point where it, the information becomes just a number. Let's talk about this in a little better perspective. You see the number of recording pixels that get, onto your, that get onto your memory card every time you take a full resolution JPEG or RAW image with this camera. But in terms of what that's going to deliver for you, think about this. If you print at 300 DPI without any enlargement whatsoever of the file, if you just bring a file into Photoshop or some other program and simply say print, you're printing about a 22 by 15 inch image. And that's with no enlargement or interpolation. Now, obviously, we can you know, enlarge from there uh, with great effect. We get a lot of questions about file sizes. In terms of what are the file sizes on the memory card? You go take a picture. What gets written onto the card? A raw file is going to be, and the sizes will vary slightly, but a raw file is going to be about 37 megabytes for each click of the shutter on the memory card. A full resolution fine JPEG would be a roughly 8.8 .8 million pixels, and of course that'll vary depending on the scene and so on. Now, you bring a full resolution image into Photoshop, what does Photoshop see? In Photoshop's 8-bit setting, it's seeing an 86 megabyte file. And, you know, again, let's put this in perspective. I'm sure many of you have been around the block with cameras before. Remember, not that long ago, where stock photo agencies and other photo buyers were crying for 50 megabyte files. Uh, obviously, as an industry, we've passed that threshold, not just Canon, but certainly many of our competitors too. But again, at the 8-bit file size, without any enlargement of the file, you're looking at an 86 megabyte file in Photoshop. If you bring it into Photoshop 16-bit space, you double that. One of the big questions we get is in terms of, you know, what's our ISO range, which is, again, just a number. We can throw that on the screen, but what are some of the impacts of that going to be? The basic ISO range of the 5D Mark IV is 100 to 32,000. So it's been boosted a third of a stop over what it was on the 5D Mark III, which is obviously isn't a huge increase. That can be expanded in steps on the high end, and you can knock it down on the low end as well to ISO 50. So you've got a pretty broad range that you can work with there. Now, in terms of 
how much noise do you get as you start bringing the ISOs up? You know, many of you probably are familiar with the 5D Mark III camera, even if you didn't own one. I'm sure you're, you're familiar enough with the images coming out of the 5D Mark III camera. And it's, it's an interesting comparison. Up to about 6400, the noise levels between the two are actually pretty similar. Now keep in mind, that's actually a win for the 5D Mark IV because it has 50% more pixels. The pixels have to be smaller. And all else being equal, smaller pixels mean less sensitivity for each pixel and typically more noise as our ISOs go up. So the fact that we're able to keep it pretty much level is a win in that regard. When you start bringing the ISOs even higher, what you start to see is a couple of interesting things. There's less noise reduction on the 5D Mark IV in terms of what goes on in camera. And you have higher pixel resolution, so there's certainly more detail. The absolute level of noise remains, again, pretty similar between the two. But if you start getting into ISOs like 25,000 and above, you start to see a difference. And if you ever do get in situations where you really have to push it, uh, if you expand it to the extreme of 102,000 ISO, uh, I'm not saying that there's no noise in a 5D Mark IV image. Obviously, at 100,000 100, ISO, there is. But it's a lot nicer than what we were able to do with a 5D Mark III at those expanded ISO settings. Now, the camera has high ISO noise reduction built into it. Many of you are going to be doing your own noise reduction and processing in third-party programs, whether it's a Lightroom or something like that. But in terms of what the camera offers in the camera and what you can do with Canon software as well, you have four options. And one of them you may not have seen before, which is the option of multi-shot noise reduction. So I just want to give you a quick idea of what this is like. I'm going to show you a sample image here, and we'll look at a little detailed area of it. This is shot at ISO 12,800. These are from raw images. And what we did was just take a look at that detailed section, shooting it first with noise reduction off. And you can see, obviously, the noise is pretty pronounced. Then at the low setting, at standard, which, as you would expect, is what the camera is set to when you take it out of the box, the strong setting reduces it slightly from standard, but there isn't a huge difference. But the multi-shot noise reduction is interesting. What it does is it takes four rapid pictures, click, 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 and then processes them into a finished JPEG image. So it's not a raw imaging tool, but if you are working in a JPEG workflow, this can be kind of interesting. And the effect is actually pretty good in terms of its ability to correct for noise. Now, you may be thinking, oh, well, if you're taking multiple shots, that would only work if you're on a tripod. Actually, it has a self-alignment capability. So as long as you are careful in your hand holding, I mean, obviously, if you swing the camera around, there's a limit to what it can do. But if you're careful in your hand holding, you can shoot those four pictures in a row, click, 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 click and it'll process them into one finished JPEG with a significant reduction in terms of how much noise is present. So it's an interesting tool to have in your pocket. Not necessarily that you're going to use it all the time, but it is an interesting tool to have. Some of the other imaging features in the camera. This is one we've gotten some questions about. And as we talk about some of these other imaging features, we're going to talk about some things that are new if you're coming up from an older 5D model. If you're coming from a 5D Mark III, a 5D Mark II, you're going to see some things here that you haven't seen before. But some of these have been introduced in our line recently in other cameras like the 5DS and 5DSR, EOS 7D Mark II, or even the EOS 1DX Mark II. So uh, if you're you know, familiar with those cameras, these won't seem brand new. But again, if you're coming from an older EOS 5D series model or an older EOS model period, uh, there's a couple of things here to be aware of. In terms of your white balance, white balance control is exactly the same as on previous EOS cameras, except with your auto white balance, you now have two choices. Auto white balance with Canon up to now has always given you in tungsten type lighting or lighting similar to tungsten lighting, warm kind of lighting, we have deliberately allowed some of that warmth to show. The idea the engineers had was that this would give you kind of an ambient effect and it's, it's kind of a pleasant look and that kind of thing. Sometimes obviously it can work, sometimes no. If it didn't work up to now, your choice was, okay, I got to switch the white balance to a pure tungsten setting or maybe even do a custom white balance or whatever, depending. Now we give you a choice. You can use what we call 
ambient priority auto white balance, which is the, the normal auto white balance setting. And that behaves exactly the same as we've done up to now. If you're shooting in a tungsten lit environment or a similarly warm lit environment, you'll get some deliberate warmth in the picture. But you have a second option in the menu called white priority auto white balance, which will do its best to clean the whites up and give you, if you will, a clinical looking white uh, in your images. Again, it's auto white balance, so it'll, you know, it'll vary depending on you know, a, a, n a number of factors in the scene. But you do have this choice now. Now this white priority auto white balance really only is a factor in tungsten or similar lighting. If you go outside at high noon or on an overcast day, it really doesn't matter which auto white balance setting you're using. They'll both behave, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same. It's only when tungsten or tungsten-like light comes into the scene that now you have that divergence. And again, all the other auto white balance settings behave the same way. Another thing that's been added that we saw with the, 5D, with the 5DS and 5DSR is a new picture style called fine detail picture style. Um, first off, it gives you less contrast than our standard picture style, but it also adds some unsharp mask-like controls and deliberately sets them at, by, at its default to give you even finer sharpening on fine edges and so on. This has no effect on the raw, right? Well, it's tagged to a raw image. The, qu the question was, and I want to say, I should say this as well, and I'm certainly not scolding the gentleman. Um, because we're live streaming, we want to ask that we hold questions until the end, and I will be happy to answer all questions. So if you have a question, just jot it down or you know, speak it into your phone real quick or something, and I will be happy to answer all questions at the end. But to, to, to answer your question, the question was, would this, does this impact raw files or not? The information is tagged onto a raw file. If you process it in Canon's digital photo professional software, it reads that tag, and if you don't change it, it'll process the picture that way. You can, you're certainly free to change it if you want to, like you could change a white balance or whatever. If you use third-party raw file processing, normally those tags are ignored. Now the fineness and threshold settings that you have now, again, the fineness is kind of like the radius setting in Photoshop's unsharp mask command, and the threshold setting is the same. So we have not just sharpening control now in all the picture style settings, but the equivalent, if you will, of the unsharp mask settings that you have in Photoshop. So you've got significantly more control over your sharpening in the camera. For those of you who occasionally or even frequently do work in a JPEG workflow, this is important. Uh, and even if you do shoot raw, if you process in our software, it gives you another measure of control that you can preset in the camera and that you can redo once you get into the computer. One of the cool things in the 5D Mark IV is that we don't just have more pixels, but we're able to do even more with those pixels. And one example of that is the enhancements made to the Canon lens aberration corrections, which we've had in EOS cameras for a while now. But you got even more there, and I'll talk about that a little bit. We've had peripheral illumination correction, which is basically in-camera correction of vignetting, darkening as you move from the center of an image towards the corner when you shoot with a wide lens aperture, particularly when you're shooting against like a broad, even light-colored area like the sky or something. And we've had chromatic aberration correction as well. And we've had those tools in the camera for some time. And out of the box, they give us better imagery and less work correcting after the fact in an, in an image editing program like Photoshop or something similar. Recent cameras have added lens distortion correction, which corrects for linear distortion, that sort of fisheye effect on straight lines when you're shooting with a zoom lens at a wide setting, or conversely, the pincushion effect, which is like the opposite of a fisheye effect that you might get with certain wide to tele zooms when you work telephoto. But they've added a couple of new things here uh, with the 5D Mark IV, and they're things that are worth knowing about. One of them, which we did see in the EOS 1DX Mark II, so this isn't the first camera with it, is diffraction correction. But the big news is the enhancements to the digital lens optimizer technology. You can think of this as a very, very lens-specific smart form of sharpening. And the fact that we don't have to do it in DPP now, in digital photo professional software, that we can do it to some degree in the camera, really is kind of nice. 
This, com this control, this digital lens optimizer, basically is able to look at a number of very specific aberrations that can be present in certain lenses. The camera knows what lens you have on it, if it's a Canon EF or uh, TSE or whatever lens. It knows the lens aperture you're working at, and it knows the focusing distance you're set to, or approximately the focusing distance you're set to. So armed with that information, the engineers know what kind of aberrations to expect. As much as I'd like to say that all Canon lenses are perfect, there is no such thing as a perfect lens. And what this is able to do is to take what we used to have to do in the computer, in Digital Photo Professional, and now apply it to JPEG images as we shoot them. You can apply it to raw images, and of course this camera, not the first camera in our line to do it, has in, cam it has in the camera raw processing capability. You can shoot a raw file and literally play it back and say, okay, I want to do this one and actually process that raw file in the camera and write a new JPEG onto the memory card. Now, I know most people, when they process a raw file, are going to be doing it in the computer. But you can apply these if you ever did do the raw processing in camera. And of course, you can continue to do it in DPP as well. Again, we know that some people, either occasionally or more than occasionally, need to work in a JPEG workflow. This is going to give you a very, very smart form of sharpening. It's not like a night and day difference when you use the digital lens optimizer, but it is really a nice thing to have in the toolbox. Now, I will warn you, this is very processor intensive. So if you turn the digital lens optimizer on, and you can turn it on and off in the menu, if you turn it on, the camera does slow down significantly. You're not going to be able to get 10 frames, I'd rather 7 frames a second out of the camera with the digital lens optimizer on. It's going to be a lot slower. But when you're working, you know, for somebody shooting landscapes, for instance, or whatever, this might be something to consider. One of the imaging commands we've gotten a lot of questions about uh, is this one. And there's been uh, quite a buzz online about it. Many independent web commentators have played with this feature. The dual pixel raw capability, which we now have in this camera. Um, it is a new option when you shoot RAW files. Yeah, you can turn it on and off separately, uh, so understand right up front if that, this hasn't been made clear to you already. This dual pixel RAW is not just something that happens anytime you shoot a RAW picture. You can continue to shoot RAW images with this camera the same way that you have with previous cameras, absolutely no difference. It's a separate menu setting in the shooting menu, dual pixel RAW, enable or disable, and by default it's disabled. You have to turn it on. If you turn it on, what happens is in effect, you're giving the raw file, that CR2 raw file, an additional, I use this phrase figuratively, not literally, an additional, if you will, layer of information where information from half of each pixel is used to give us kind of a parallax sort of information. So we've got the raw information that we don't always have had, and then you have, second, you have a secondary information which is offset slightly physically. And this is utilizing the technology at the imaging sensor that we've had for the dual pixels autofocus, which we'll talk about in a bit. Basically, if you do this and you process the image in the Canon digital photo professional software, which comes with the camera, you don't have to go out and buy it or anything, you have three processing options. You can do any one of these three to a dual pixel raw file. You can do an image micro adjustment. You can do what we call a bokeh shift or you can do what we call ghosting reduction. The effects are subtle. Let me repeat that. The effects are subtle. They are not night and day type changes. They're not like using the clone tool in Photoshop or anything like that. But they can potentially be useful in some situations. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of what they basically are going to do. One that's gotten the most attention is the image micro adjustment. This is not the ability to just simply change focus, to focus from the foreground to the background or something. That is not what this is about. What it is going to let you do is very subtly tweak the plane of sharpest, of greatest sharpness in an image, forward or backward. How much depends on a number of factors, including the lens you're using, the distance you are to your subject. It definite, any of these techniques definitely perform better when you're shooting at relatively wide lens apertures. People who stop their lens down to f16 or f22 
are probably going to see very, very little difference, you know, before and after. People who tend to shoot closer to wide open, that's where you start to see some of the differences. But in this shot of the bike rider, for instance, if we look at the areas around the front of his head and his temple, and just look at the detail there, this is before any adjustment, that's after. I'll go back and forth a couple of times so you can see. But whoops, I'm sorry. Before, after, before, after. And it's hard to see, for those of you here live, it's hard to see on the monitors, and you may have a tough time seeing it online. It's, it's subtle. There are times, though, where it, if you just miss the focus on an eye in a portrait or something, where it may be able to bring it back nicely for you. It's not, I'm not going to kid you. If you tried to focus on the eye and you got the ear instead, <laughs> the likelihood that this is going to bring it back to the eye is it's probably not going to happen, at, at least in its current incarnation. The bokeh shift is an interesting one because what it lets us do is literally shift out of focus areas laterally without really moving the subject. Now, when we first saw this, we thought of this as something in terms of moving background information slightly. But the engineers made an interesting point, and that is that one of the most, one of the, maybe one of the most common uses that could, this could be applied to is when you have to shoot through something like a fence and you have foreground information that just you can't get around. This may let you move it slightly. I'll give you an example here on screen. This is with the bokeh shifted fully to the right, fully to the left. And I'll go back and forth a couple of times. And you can see this four, there's a foreground branch there, definitely out of focus, blurring the young lady. Same image. It's not two different images or anything. Uh, but by shifting it all the way to the right, all the way to the left, you can see that there is a difference. Now again, the degree of difference will vary depending on the, circuit, the scene you're shooting, the distances involved, the lens you're using, the aperture you're using, and so on. There is no one straight formula that, oh, it always does this. But it's a tool that, again, maybe might be helpful for you. The final option you have with, the, uh, with this tool is the ghosting reduction. And what that's going to let you do is if you've got an image with lens flare, and it has to be specific types of lens flare. It has to be flare that's generated from a light source just outside the picture area, like way off to the side. It's kind of impinging the lens from a sideways angle. It's not going to do much, if anything, if you just simply take a backlit scenic with the sun in the frame and you have the, you know, the, the shower-like flare kind of coming from the sun. That's not what it's going to change. That's, a, that's something you're going to have to do in an image editing program. But what this is going to do is let you draw a box around the flared areas, like you have in this sample picture here. And once you make the correction, it'll reduce it slightly. So again, we, that's after, before, after, before, after. So again, I repeat, in all three areas, the changes are indeed subtle. And this is not like, you know, the, the you know, magic tools in, a, in an image editing program or something. We understand that it's not necessarily going to answer every need that every customer has. But it is an interesting option to have in the toolbox. Keep in mind to be able to use it, you not only have to be shooting RAW images, you have to enable the dual pixel RAW capability. And I, I must inform you, when you do, you end up with a larger file on the memory card. We mentioned already that if you shoot a straight raw, full res raw image with the 5D Mark IV, the file size on your memory card for each file is roughly 37 megs. It can vary a little bit, but figure roughly 37 megabytes, give or take. It's going to be closer to about 60, 65 megabytes with the dual pixel raw activated for every click of the shutter. And that same increase in file size is, means that your shooting speed and your burst rate go down. So probably not the right tool if you're shooting things like birds in flight or sports or something like that. But you know, for people working in critical situations, and again, I, I gave the example of if you're in a situation where you had to shoot through fencing or something and you couldn't get around it, you may want to turn it on and try at least taking a couple of shots. And then when you get back to the computer, work with them in DPP software uh, and see if, if, it's, if it's good for you. Now, a few other things. And these, once again, are not brand new in the Canon system. But we want to make sure that people are aware that, once again, you got these tools in the toolbox. You got these in your back pocket. And it, it surprises me how often many, even long-time Canon users, aren't really aware they have these. So on top of the new stuff that's in the 5D Mark IV, you have these that can help you as well. One that I like to talk about a lot is highlight tone priority. 
uh, which is a tool that whether you shoot RAW or JPEG, can give you up to an additional stop of detail in your bright highlights without changing your midtones or your shadows. If you're in danger in a brightly lit situation, I mean a classic example is a bride in a white wedding dress in a, you know, out in a sunny day or whatever. Even when you're shooting raw where you have some headroom in terms of being able to capture detail that appears blown out, there's a limit, a finite limit as to how much you can do. And if you're shooting JPEGs and you overexpose those areas, that's it, the party's over. Highlight Tone Priority gives you a bit of a, of a safety net. Now, I'll, I'll caution the people that are in the room. The monitors here are a little contrasty. They're good performance monitors, but they're a little contrasty. So you're not gonna see quite the same effect on the monitor that you do looking at the computer. But anybody who's curious about this, after our presentation, those of you who are in the room, you're welcome to come up, and I'll be glad to show you on the screen. You can see the difference more vividly. But here's a shot where we deliberately, it's a, it's a window display in an antique shop, we deliberately manually exposed so that we would just be on that edge of burning out the highlights. And the highlights there are burned out. This is not good. The histogram shows that they're, you know, it's butting up against the far edge. Uh, this is, this would not be what you'd want if you were a wedding photographer. With highlight tone priority, again, the exposure is manual exposure. Exposure doesn't change. All we did was simply turn highlight tone priority on, take the same picture. There's a difference. And again, there's more detail in the actual shot than what you're seeing here on the monitors. Uh, highlight tone priority, and this is something that we have even in our Rebel line, and we have for a while. If you haven't experimented with this, you should. It can be a really nifty tool. And it isn't just when you miss exposure. If you're taking a backlit picture late in the afternoon, you got that, the sun giving you a highlight off of a person's hair or something. Uh, again, it can give you more enhanced detail in those highlights. I'm not saying you'll never ever burn out a highlight, but it's a great tool to work with. Another one that a lot of people in our system don't really understand what it does is Auto Lighting Optimizer, which really does two things. The primary thing that the Auto Lighting Optimizer does is it does the opposite of Highlight Tone Priority. It adds detail to mid-tone and shadow areas when the system thinks that they are underexposed. Now, as a secondary feature, if you shoot an image in a very flat lighting situation, the, the one I always think of is if you're just outside on like a foggy morning or something, and you have the auto lighting optimizer on, if the scene is really flat, it'll actually perform a tone curve adjustment and kick the contrast up a little bit for you. But here's an example of the former, that is adding shadow detail. Two shots, again, taken manual exposure, so we didn't change the exposure at all. But here's with the auto lighting optimizer off, and you can see that there's, the shadows are getting pretty dark in here. With the auto lighting optimizer turned to the strong setting, and there are three different levels that you can work with it at, but with it turned to the strong setting, you can see there's a notable difference. And I'll go back and forth a couple of times. What I want you to notice is, if you look at the areas here in this window, these highlight areas and mid-tone areas, they don't really change. Again, anybody can change the level of the shadows by just lightening the whole exposure. That's a tool you always have available to you. Uh, but here, what the technology is doing, again, I'll go back and forth a couple times, what the technology is doing is giving you a little bit of a safety net if your shadows are just kind of a little murky. Uh, Auto Lighting Optimizer, if you're in a situation where you have important shadow detail, again, experiment with it. Now, in answer to the inevitable question, Highlight Tone Priority, Auto Lighting Optimizer, they definitely apply when you're working with JPEG images. They just are, if you will, baked into the image, so to speak. They apply when you're working with video. If you shoot a raw image file and you bring it into Canon software, it's applied there. If you use somebody else's software, they are ignored. And incidentally, we get this question a lot. Well, when I shoot raw images, if I use third-party software to process that raw file, what camera settings are locked into that raw file. If I monkey with my settings, what settings are burned into that file? And there are only two. One of them is gonna be your white balance correction. Not white balance, you know, daylight, tungsten, that kind of thing, but your white balance correction where you can literally change it along the blue amber axis or the green magenta axis. And the other is long exposure noise reduction. If you apply either of those, they are in that CR2 file, and it doesn't matter whose software you use to process it, they are going to be reflected in that when you open it up. Anything else is basically tagged onto the image, 
And if you process it in, th process it in third party software, usually it's ignored. One of the cool changes on the 5D Mark IV is the metering system. Uh, and again, this isn't brand, brand new in the Canon line, uh, but we've gone over to a 150,000 pixel RGB metering system. So if you're coming from an earlier 5D version, an original 5D, a 5D Mark II or Mark III, this is new territory. And this is some pretty cool stuff. The metering system in this camera Instead of just simply reading light, the metering sensor itself is like a little imaging sensor. It's located up in the prism area, the same as most digital SLRs. And what it does is it reads color information as well as just simple brightness. And by doing so, we're getting a lot more than just simply plain old exposure as we have for decades with, with SLR cameras. It's able to read color. It's able to detect your subject in terms of its shape, its size, its location, and it has face detect capabilities as well, which it can actually use for ambient light metering and for ETTL flash control. So right off the bat, it is a different system than what we've had in previous incarnations of the 5D. So if you're coming to us from an older, from an older 5D camera, you, buy, you invest in a 5D Mark IV and you take the two cameras out and shoot similar things with them, you may see that there are some differences in the way evaluative metering works and others because the metering sensor is totally different. I mean, they're as different as chocolate and vanilla. But it is going to really do a nice job. And we'll talk in a bit about some of the enhancements that it brings. One, right off the bat, is ETTL flash metering. Uh, where it not only simply reads reflected brightness from a pre-flash, but it also is able to read color information and it can detect faces. When it detects a face, it literally concentrates exposure information there, so it's less likely to be thrown off by bright or dark clothing and backgrounds and that kind of thing. A couple of other exposure-related features that many of our advanced customers have asked for. One is the auto ISO setting has been enhanced. Now this is one that I think was brought into the digital SLR world to kind of make life easy for the casual users. And many of our advanced photographers have actually found that auto ISO over the years really is a great tool. And there are many advanced and even pro users who use auto ISO on a frequent basis. Um, but what you have now We've added three additional controls to the auto ISO in the 5D Mark IV that earlier 5D versions didn't have. Again, now some of this stuff we have in cameras like the, the new 7D Mark II, the 5DS and 5DSR and so on. So they're not necessarily brand new to the Canon line. But again, if you're coming to us from an older camera, particularly the older 5D models, this is new stuff. One is you can define when you're working in the program mode or the aperture priority mode, where the camera by default, by definition, is going to be changing shutter speeds for you. With auto ISO, you can define what is the slowest shutter speed you want the system to work with before, as light falls, what's the slowest speed you want it to work with before it starts raising ISOs to keep that shutter speed at a certain level. It used to be that you were locked into the, the, the fastest speed you could set for that slow speed limit was a 250th. And sometimes that wasn't enough. Now, you can manually set any speed up to an 8,000th of a second. You can tell the system, hey, I don't want the speeds to go below, just hypothetically, a 1,000th of a second. If the light drops so that it has to go below that, start raising the ISO automatically. Uh, so any speed from one full second up to an 8,000th can now manually be set. We've had an auto setting as well, which by default is the old one over the lens focal length rule of thumb as a minimum shutter speed. But think about it, if you're working with a wide angle lens, a 24 millimeter lens, just for one example, that means that it's, you're telling the system, hey, let the speeds drop down to a 30th of a second or about that before we start raising ISOs. And that, again, depending on what you're shooting, that may not be enough. You may be able to hand hold the camera steadily, but if your subjects are moving around to any degree, that just simply may not be sufficient for you. So in the auto setting, you now not a, you know, you're no longer locked into one over the lens focal length. You can tweak that in full stop increments up to three stops faster than one over the focal length, or you can go the other way. If you want more lens openings or whatever, you can tell it, hey, let it go up to three stops slower than one over the focal length when you set that minimum shutter speed to auto. 
And then finally, there's a neat tool for people who like to work in the manual exposure mode with the auto ISO, and that is that you can now deliberately under and overexpose. You can apply exposure compensation in manual mode with the auto ISO. So you can lock in, hypothetically, a 500th of a second F4, I'm, I'm making those numbers up, and you can tell the system, hey, when I point the camera in the sun, just set a, a low ISO. When I point it in the shade or in a dark area, set a higher ISO. Um, but what we weren't able to do before was tell the system, all right, I want to deliberately lighten or darken this. It, it wouldn't let you do it. If you change the shutter speed or whatever, it, just changed the, it would just change the ISO to match. Now, you can reprogram either the set button on the back of the camera or the new AF area button on the back of the camera. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And you can just press that button and turn the main dial up on top of the camera and deliberately lighten or darken your pictures in the manual mode when you have auto ISO working. So people who like to work in auto ISO, this is going to be a very flexible camera when you're working in ambient light. A Couple of other things just quick to be aware of. This is the first 5D series model that's gonna let you define the range of speeds and apertures you wanna work with. Normally we want the camera to be, whether we're manually setting our controls or whether we're working in a mode like shutter priority or aperture priority, we normally want to be able to have all the speeds and, and apertures available to us so that if light changes, we got all the changes available. But if you're working in a fixed situation, that could be anything from working a, a basketball game where you're sitting under the hoop and you're going to be there all day uh, to you know, working uh, in, in a studio with studio strobe lights or whatever. You may say to yourself, self, I don't want to run the risk of accidentally changing a setting radically or something like that. So you can define the range of shutter speeds and lens openings that the camera can work with if you want to keep it to a confined range. Uh, it's available to you if you want it, right in the camera menu. And then here's another one which is interesting, and I gotta be honest, when I first heard of this, and this is, we've had this on a few other cameras, but again, it's new to the 5D series uh, for people coming up from earlier 5Ds in the EOS 5D Mark IV. And this is, if you're working in the manual mode and your maximum aperture changes, the camera can automatically correspond to that. Let me give you an example. You're outside shooting with, say, your 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 lens, or in this case, a 300 millimeter 2.8, and then you go and you put a 2x extender on. You're working at a, at a fast shutter speed and with the lens wide open at f2.8. Now, you put that extender on, effectively, you're no longer at 2.8. That, two, time, that two, two times extender, you lose two stops of light. Effectively, now you're at f5.6. If you're working in manual exposure mode, what do you do? You had to remember to either change your ISO manually or change your shutter speeds manually to keep the exposure constant when you throw that 2x extender on working in the manual exposure mode. Okay, now you've got the ability to tell the camera, hey, and it, you've got to turn this on. It isn't on by default. But right in the menu, you can tell the system, hey, change the exposure automatically for me when I'm in manual mode and the maximum aperture of the lens changes if I'm shooting like wide open. And you have the choice of telling it change the shutter speeds or change the ISOs, which is kind of cool. This also would work if you were working with a variable aperture zoom lens. Uh, think about you know, a lens that has an aperture, a variable zoom from like f3.5 to 5.6. Maybe for a long time you're shooting with the lens wide open at f3.5 at the wide angle setting, but then you zoom in. Uh, what, would ha what happens? You have to remember if you're shooting in the manual mode, you know, hey, I gotta change my shutter speeds or I gotta change my ISO. This will do it for you. It's kind of a neat tool. For a long time, uh, 5D users who have wanted to shoot long exposures or do interval shots have had to go to an accessory device like our optional accessory TC80N3 timer remote controller which has timer mechanisms built into it and plug it into the camera. And while I don't do a lot of nighttime photography on a tripod, uh, I'd have a couple of bucks in my pocket if I got a nickel for every time I wanted to do something. I remember, darn, I forgot the darn controller at home or at the office or something like that. I didn't put it in the camera bag. So you're left at just you know, doing it on your own. Here, you got a couple of timers built in. You have a bulb exposure timer right in the menu. You can tell the system when you're in the bulb mode, hey, shutter speed anywhere from one second to almost 100 hours. Obviously, to do it 100 hours, you need to be hooked up to an AC power supply. And separately, you have interval timer capability. You can tell the system, hey, 
shoot pictures repeatedly at intervals anywhere from one second, once again, up to 99 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds between each shot. Now, the one thing, unfortunately, it won't let you do is work with both at the same time. You can do one, you can do the other. You can't do both of them at the same time with the controls in the camera. But if you're just in a situation where you're driving down the road at night and suddenly you see a moonlit field and you're thinking, oh, great, I got the tripod in the back of the camera, this would make a great shot, you've got the ability to do things like a timed long exposure, uh, or if you wanted to do an interval of you know, the moon coming up over the horizon and shoot a picture every you know, 15 minutes or whatever it might be, you've got the ability now, even if you left that TC-80N3 at home, to be able to do that kind of stuff. Now, the one thing people will ask, well, does that mean I don't need my TC-80N3 anymore, if you happen to own one? The one thing that this can't do, that the TC-80N3 can, is the TC-80N3, the optional timer remote control cord, has also a self-timer capability, which in effect lets you set the camera up and tell it, okay, start taking pictures later. You could hypothetically, if you felt the camera was safe, you could set the camera on a tripod up on the Brooklyn side of the Brooklyn Bridge, a wide angle lens, uh, and tell the system at three in the afternoon, hey, I'm setting the camera up now. I want to shoot an interval of shots, you know, the sun setting over Manhattan or whatever, uh, and shoot a picture every 15 minutes. But I want it to start in two hours at five o'clock when the sun's starting to go down or whatever. The TC80N3 will let you do that. You don't have those kind of self timer commands built into the 5D Mark IV. So I just want to make sure you're clear on that. So the TC80N3 still has a role in life. When you look in the viewfinder of the new EOS 5D Mark IV, again, if you're coming to us from an earlier camera, you're going to see some new things. Uh, it's what we call an intelligent viewfinder too. And don't panic, you don't see all this stuff at once. <laughs> this is much more like what you would tend to see in ordinary shooting situations. Um, but the, the viewfinder display, it gives you an LCD overlay uh, that allows you to see the location of all your focusing points if you want. It allows you to highlight the focusing points that are active. Uh, it gives you a strip of information along the bottom with a variety of camera settings. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And it gives you the ability to see a dedicated for a dual axis dis level display up on top of the viewfinder as well, right through the finder itself. Uh, so even if you're hand holding, you can sort of tell if you're level or not level, which is kind of neat. Now, like I said, this is very customizable. If you, if you think, oh, this is too much information, you can go into the setup menu and you can define exactly what you want. You can have the, you can have the viewfinder show you nothing, not even a focus point if that's what you want to do. And you can still be working in autofocus if you ever wanted to do that. So don't feel like you're compelled to work with just what you see here. The information on the bottom is kind of cool in one regard, well, aside from just being able to see what your settings are. And that is that if you're shooting through the viewfinder, you can customize the multifunction button and allow it to toggle through four different sets of settings and let you change them looking through the viewfinder by turning either the main dial on the top of the camera or the quick control dial on the back of the camera. So you can do that without taking your camera away from your eye, which is pretty cool if you want to suddenly make a quick change to something. And again, that involves taking the multifunction button and customizing it in the custom controls to do this. And what it's going to let you do is toggle through changing your flash compensation with one dial and your ISO with the other. Now those would be displayed down underneath on the bottom with the shutter speed and aperture and that kind of thing. Or you can change the drive with one dial and the autofocus, that is one shot servo uh, AI focus with the other. Or you can change your white balance setting or your metering mode, evaluative, center weighted, spot partial. Again, with the two different dials. And you just push the button and you can see which one is ready, which pair are ready to go. So if you're in situations where you kind of need to change things on the fly quickly, this can actually be a pretty cool little way of using this additional information in the intelligent viewfinder. And again, if, you, if all this stuff is like, hey, look, I shoot in one kind of situation, I, I, I shoot outdoors all the time, I'm not changing my white balance all the time, I don't need to worry about this, that's fine. You don't even need to display that information if you don't want to. It's entirely up to you. Here's something that is new to the 5D Mark IV, and that is the ability to control, to a degree, how images display on the back LCD monitor. You can change the LCD monitor's color tone. One of the reasons for this 
is that the monitor on the camera is actually new compared to the previous system. It's a higher resolution monitor. It's about 1.6 million dots as opposed to roughly 1 million dots on the 5D Mark III. So it's a finer resolution monitor. And if you look close, you can see the difference when you compare side to side. Um, but the monitor itself is a little different in how it displays color. So what we let you do, and these effects are simulated, but they give you an idea. We have a standard setting, but then we have a warm tone one, which lets you warm the colors up, adds you know, some amber to it. And then conversely, there's a cool tone one and a cool tone two that cool the display off. Now, I want to make sure right up front that we're totally, totally clear on this. This does not change your actual images in any way. The files on your memory card are totally unaffected. This is just simply how do they display on the monitor. And uh, for those of you, we've already had some comments from folks who were using older cameras, older EOS cameras, that were working side by side with the new camera and said, the LCD display is, the colors are a little different on my old camera compared to my new one. How can I get them to be the same? And basically, if you have an older camera, an older EOS camera, I'm not talking a different brand now, uh, and you want to, to the greatest degree you can, match the new camera to what the old camera is displaying, because of course that, the monitor on that is not adjustable. What you want to probably do is go to the Cool Tone 1 or the Cool Tone 2 settings. And those will get the display looking closer to what you had in an earlier 5D or an earlier 1D series camera or something like that. Another thing that we've added, this is the first Canon EOS camera that out of the box has had this capability, is the ability to add what we call IPTC data. Now, this is in addition to all the regular so-called EXIF shooting data that digital cameras have provided for years and years. You take a picture and then you bring the camera into your computer and you can see the date, the time, the shutter speed, the lens opening, the white balance setting, and you know, a bunch of other things depending on the camera. This is totally on top of that. IPT stands for International Press Telecommunications Council. And I got to be frank with you, when I first saw that this feature was coming, I thought, okay, you know, this comes from the newspaper and the press industry. And I thought, okay, that's going to be great for people who work in, you know, at a major photo organization or something like that. But, like, how's that going to really change the life of a single independent shooter? Um, we'll explain. This is going to let you add up to 39 different items of information and data to images that you shoot. The way it works is you're going to input the data into the camera from your computer with the EOS utility software that comes with the camera. You upload it into the camera, and then the data is applied, the information is applied to every image you take. So unlike the EXIF data, this is not going to change every time you take a picture. And there is no way to change it in the camera. So you can't just say, I'm taking a picture of Joe Smith here. Let me type in Joe Smith and then take the picture. OK, now I'm taking a picture of you know, Mary Jones here. So let me type in Mary Jones. It won't let you do that in the camera. But it is going to have some interesting capabilities. And I'll show you that in a second. Basically, you connect the camera to EOS Utility. You go into Register IPTC Info. It gives you a whole bunch of fields that you are, are available to you. You certainly don't have to use all of them. You can use just one or two if you wanted to. Type in the desired info, and then click the button down the bottom that says Apply to Camera. And with the USB connection, it'll just upload it into the camera. Now, as far as what's this information going to do for me? These are the available categories of information as defined by IPTC. I'm just going to go through them quickly, obviously. But there's a lot of stuff here. The benefit of this, and I'm not talking about for a press photographer now, for the average independent photographer, the benefit of this is you can have things like more enhanced copyright information. You can type in the real copyright symbol, not just like you know, a, you know, parentheses or something. You can give information like your contact info. You can put your URL. Now, I am not, I want to emphasize this, I am not a copyright attorney or an expert on copyright. I am led to believe, anecdotally if nothing else, that in copyright contested situations, one aspect is that it falls on the creator as a responsibility to have a way for somebody to be able to contact them 
if a picture's online and you know some somebody in some you know some publication or whatever says, oh, cool picture, I think I want to use it. So now, rather than just having a name or something, you could put in your URL. You could even put in your phone number if you wanted to. Uh, you can put in a host of additional information, which you can read in Canon's digital photo professional software, and it just shows up as an additional layer of information. You now, in DPP, when you go into show info for a picture, you have the tab for the regular EXIF information, the shooting information we've always had. Again, the date, the time, the shutter speed, all that good stuff. But then there's a second tab where you can put in, well, not put in, where you can tell it, I want to see the IPTC data. And it's broken up into categories to keep it relatively manageable. But you can display on screen, you know, the select categories of whatever you happen to have typed in. So, again, for some people, this isn't going to float your boat. And that's fine. But there are other people, even people, like I say, who have nothing to do with the news industry or whatever, who may see this and say, okay, this would be pretty cool. It can help you identifying things. If you're on a trip, you could, you know, as you go from Paris to Rome or something, you could, you know, the night before you fly to Rome, you could just hook the camera up to the computer real quick and just, you know, type in, okay, you know, Rome uh, 2016, uh, and have that information show up on all subsequent pictures. You can tell the system, hey, I want the information to be recorded or you can turn it off. In other words, I can upload the information, and then separately in the menu, I can tell the system, okay, every picture I take, record that information, or you can tell the system, hey, don't record the information, and it'll just hold it. Uh, you can delete it, to delete it, you have to hook the camera back up to the computer. So that's an, another interesting thing that uh, has come about with the new 5D Mark IV. The focusing system, and I'm talking now the 61 point focusing system when you're working shooting eye level, you know, through the viewfinder, looks the same as a 5D Mark III, but it isn't. It actually is the same focusing sensor as what we had in the top of, I have in the top of the line EOS 1DX Mark II camera. And this is going to give you a couple of important benefits. It's still 61 focusing points, so you may think, well, really, compared to my Mark III, not really much has changed. But a number of things have with this new focusing sensor. One, right off the bat, is your low light focusing capability has been improved. In one shot autofocus at the center focusing point, you can get down to EV minus three now. Now, I said earlier, a lot of times in the camera industry, we're guilty of throwing out specs and numbers, and let's face it, to a lot of us, it's almost white noise. It's just a number. But to put that EV minus three into a certain perspective, how dark is that? That would be equivalent, if you're working at ISO 100, to a 60 second exposure at f2.8. That's what EV minus three is. So it's pretty dim. A few other cool things with the new focusing sensor uh, that we have. One is that the vertical coverage, the amount of coverage, the space that it covers has been increased in the vertical dimension. But here's a biggie for many of our 5D customers, is that like the 1DX Mark II, if you're working with a tele-extender and a compatible Canon lens, and you now have a maximum aperture up to f8, depending on the lens and the converter, you can get autofocus at up to all 61 points. That is cool. Because for a long time, you either didn't get F8 autofocus at all, autofocus signed off at F5.6, and if you threw an extender on and it got slow, effectively slower than that, as your maximum aperture, party was over. Uh, and then even with recent cameras that have had F8 capability for autofocus through the viewfinder, it's been limited to just the center point and sometimes the four peripheral surrounding points. Now, depending on the camera, uh, it's not depending on the camera, excuse me, depending on the lens, and it has to be a version three extender, but if you've got certain lenses with version three extenders, you can get autofocus at all 61 points. And even with the older lenses that may not fall into that select category, you still have an expanded row across the center of focusing points, meaning with F, at F8, you can focus off center significantly. You're not locked into just center compositions. Another thing that's been added that we saw first in the 7D Mark II and then on the 5DS, 5DSR cameras is a new autofocus area setting, the large zone AF, which is kind of interesting. And that can be center, left, or right. And I mentioned earlier the AF area <coughs> button on the back of the camera, and that's this new little button right yonder. I know it's hard to see for you folks here in the room. 
It looks like a sliding switch, but it's actually a button that you press with your thumb. You don't slide it. And that's going to let you, by default, change the active AF area from a single focusing point to spot AF to your expanded AF area settings, zone AF, I mentioned the large zone AF, or even switch to automatic point selection where all the points are active for you. You can do that just by pushing that button. The button can actually be dedicated to a number of other features with the custom controls in the custom functions menu. And that can really enhance the way you work with the camera too, depending on just your own personal preferences and so on. At the very least, if you own this camera or you're seriously thinking about getting it in the near future, at the very least, I would strongly urge you, you know, once you take the camera out of the box and kind of get acclimated to it, go into your custom controls and at least set the custom control for this AF area switch so that it's what we call direct AF area selection. In other words, all you got to do is push that button and it changes the AF area from the spot AF to a single point to multiple points and so on. That in and of itself can be a, a huge time saver, saver and an encouragement to leverage the capability that you have with this focusing system. That you're not locked into just using a single focusing point. That you can change the size of a focusing point so readily. I talked a moment ago, well a few moments ago, that we have the new color metering system in the camera. 150,000 pixel RGB metering system, and I talked about it in the context of exposure. That it can really do some neat things for you, whether you're shooting ambient light, or whether you're shooting with ETTL flash. But it has a secondary capability as well, which you need to know about, and this is a nice enhancement of features that we've had in EOS cameras before. And this is called EOS ITR, pardon me. ITR stands for Intelligent Tracking and Recognition. And the way to think about this is assume you've got a moving subject and you want to not just focus on the moving subject by keep, you know, keeping a single focusing point on it, but you want to be able to track it as it moves across the frame. You don't want to keep a constant composition with the subject just in the center, just to the left, just to the right. I'll show you an example in a moment. Basically, the color metering system assists the focusing system in locating where the subject is and helps the focusing system change points to follow it across the viewfinder. Show you an example, something like this, where you've got a subject entering on one side, and we want to shoot a sequence of pictures of it, but we don't want to just keep the subject there. If we use just a single focusing point, the subject would get closer to us, but we'd have to keep it right there. With the color metering, the system is able to not only detect where we started focusing, but it knows what we focused on. It knows the approximate size, shape, color, and so on of that subject. So when that mass starts to move across the frame, the metering system is telling the focusing system, hey, now it's here, now it's here, now it's here. And it can assist the focusing system in changing focusing points when you're using the automatic point selection to be able to track it. So whether you're using automatic point selection with all 61 points active, or you're using the large zone AF, which I showed you a moment ago, or the conventional zone AF, with any of those where the system is able to automatically change focusing points for you, this EOS ITR is a cool option. Now one aspect of it is that now it lets you define where you want to begin. Let's go back to the first picture. You can tell the system, hey, I want to focus on something at one side of the frame or in the center or whatever. What you see in the menu, though, is a little confusing, so I want to make sure that you get a little clarity on that. When you go into the AF menu, under the initial focusing point for EOS ITR, the first option you see is labeled Initial AF Point Selected. Now, that may have you scratching your head saying, huh? <laughs> what they mean is that you can be working previously with a single focusing point or an expanded point somewhere else in the scene. You could have been using maybe the center focusing point, just as an example. And it's going to let you pick a different focusing point as your starting point. So I, maybe I was shooting multiple vehicles coming on this curvy road here, and I was just getting, you know, using a single focusing point, let's just say the center focusing point for discussion's sake, and I was just shooting, you know, sequences of a single image, you know, locked in a centered composition as it moved by. Maybe I said to myself, self, 
the next time a vehicle comes by, I'd like to kind of track it through this, you know, sort of bending curve in the road, but I'd like it to move through the curve. I'd like to change where it is in the frame. So I can tell the system, hey, for this one, I can change the automatic point selection, and I can tell the system, with, when I'm set to servo autofocus, I can tell it, hey, start here. I can just move a starting point to one side, the other, or whatever. So I can go from being in the center to being off center and tell the system, hey, here's where I want you to start. So that's what the first option is. Something, it lets you pick a point that's different from what you had been using before you switched to automatic point selection. That's what initial AF point selected means. The second option says manual, and then you see a string of little icons indicating the different AF areas, AF point. And that's all you see on the menu. It just says manual, icons, AF point. And okay, once again, you could be looking at that saying, huh? Basically, what this means is that Whatever AF point you had been using previously, if you manually were working with a single point in the center of the frame, for instance, when you switch over to automatic point selection, you're going to be working with the same focusing point. You are free to move it later, but when you first do the switch, it's going to be the same one. And then finally, you have an auto setting. Now, what this is going to do as your starting point for tracking a moving subject is when you press the button, all the focusing points become active for a moment. The system is going to pick as a starting point. It's going to try to focus on what it thinks is the nearest or most clearly defined subject in the scene. So if this bike stands out enough compared to its surroundings in terms of its shape, size, and color, it'll go for it. Uh, if there are other things that are competing, if there were a, just as a for instance, if this was like, I don't know, at a road race track or something and there were a host of fans along the side there or something, it might get confused by all that other detail and say, all right, we'll start over here or whatever. So auto can be useful, but just understand what it's doing. It's looking for the most prominent thing in the scene. Usually the closest thing with def definite defined detail is this is where we're going to start from. So the bottom line is that your 61 point focusing system, when you're shooting just looking through the viewfinder, you got some cool enhancements compared to what you may have had, certainly with a 5D Mark III, which also had 61 focusing points and some of these tools too, but nowhere near as refined. And then it's going to be, you know, if you pardon my saying it this way, it's almost going to be like you died and went to heaven if you're coming from the focusing systems in a 5D Mark II or an original 5D, which were much, much simpler systems. This has some really cool stuff. So even if you never get into working with live view or whatever, uh, you got some cool things you're stepping up into if you're coming from an older EOS camera. Now, the fun doesn't stop when you're talking about shooting through the viewfinder. Uh, because if you're working in live view, and live view really is a neat tool. And once again, some of our users really leverage this. Some of our users barely touch it. If you work on a tripod and you haven't played with live view, shame on you. It's, it's absolutely perfect for many, many tripod-oriented situations for composition, for focusing, for setting exposure, and a bunch of other reasons. One of the things now, though, on the 5D Mark III that really has raised the game is the advent of the dual-pixel CMOS AF technology. This is a focusing technology where we are focusing off the imaging sensor itself. Now, almost every other camera out there that is able to do live view or has an electronic viewfinder, we do not have an electronic viewfinder, of course, uh, but almost every other camera that has live view capability in today's digital SLR world is able to focus off the imaging sensor in some way, shape, or form, using pixels on the imaging sensor to actually help with focus, not just simply recording information. But dual pixel CMOS autofocus is a technology that really has changed the way that type of autofocusing works. It's smooth, it's positive, it's rapid, it's a lot closer, I won't say it's the same because it isn't, but it's a lot closer to the performance you get shooting through the viewfinder than almost any other system out there. Every pixel on the imaging sensor ends up giving us focus information. And you can do actual focusing over roughly 80% horizontally and 80% vertically of the actual imaging sensor itself. I won't bore you with the actual technology of it in terms of how it works. We've seen it before on the EOS 70D and 80D cameras. 
It was carried over onto the uh, 7D Mark II, uh, and we now see it on the EOS 1DX Mark II as well. But this, I think, on this camera really makes it a game changer for two reasons. One is the positive nature of it, and it's been refined even above what we've had previously. But then the second thing is that we've got a touchscreen interface that is second to none. When you're, and this is a full touchscreen interface on the 5D Mark IV. So whether you're just going through your menu settings, whether you're scrolling through playing back pictures, you can just sort of swipe through the pictures like you would on a smartphone or a mobile device. Uh, and certainly when you're working in live view, it is a pleasure. You have several different choices for your focusing when you're in live view. And I'm not gonna go into all of them here, but basically if you tell the system, hey, I wanna focus with just a single point when I'm working in live view, you can, tell, you can just tap the screen and the camera will focus there. Tap the screen and the camera will focus there. It is a joy. If you're doing, even if you're not working on a tripod, if you're doing things like macro work or whatever, to be able to just simply say, okay, you know, focus there, and to have it do it, it is so cool. It really is. Seeing is believing. I know for those of you in the room, and certainly for our online viewers, there's very little that I can show you here. For those of you who, ha who are privileged enough to be here with us at b and I have a colleague who is working, you may have seen him, at a table outside our room here who is showing uh, the 5D Mark IV and some of our other gear. If you haven't seen this, after our presentation, you can see me or see my colleague outside and actually see when you put the camera in live view how cool this is. It is neat. Talk a little bit about the video features of the camera. Now, right up front, I, I know the folks who don't shoot video or, you know, kind of groaning and going, oh, okay, you know, I'm not a video shooter, I'm a still shooter, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, and that's, that's fine. It's another tool in the toolbox. We have people here in the room, I know, who are, you know, serious video users who leverage a lot of these tools to make great video content. We have people out there who have been shooting still images for a long time and occasionally are called upon, whether it's because they want to expand their professional work and their value to their clients, or they just want to start expanding with other creative visual options with you know, recording video in a digital SLR camera. This certainly isn't the first camera that's had video in a digital SLR, but we've refined it significantly. You have 4K video capability, high resolution, 4K recording up to 30 frames a second. Uh, working at full HD or, or HD at 720p, you can go at faster frame rates, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Uh, and when you're not working in 4K, you also have, compared to the 5D Mark III and some of our earlier cameras with video, you have a lot more choices in terms of not just frame rates, but compression types and file types as well. Again, not the 4K, which is lock, locks you into motion JPEG uh, file type, but when you go to full HD or HD, you get a lot more choices than you were used to seeing previously. A Couple of points about the video. Uh, like some of our other cameras, it's easy to get to now. You don't have to go into the menu and tell the system, hey, I wanna shoot video and whatever. Uh, there's a dedicated switch on the side, just set it over to the little red video camera icon and you've told the system, hey, I'm ready for video. The mirror will go up right at that point so you can start seeing right through the LCD monitor. And then you just press the central button to start recording, press it again to stop recording. And you can also set up the shutter button so that the shutter button can be your start and stop device as well. That's up to you. Now, I mentioned that you have the slow motion capability at 120 frames a second. If you go to the standard, not standard definition, but if you go to HD, 720p video, and you got a choice of 119 frames a second, or if you set the camera for the PAL video system for overseas users uh, at 100 frames a second. Once again, I fall back on the phrase we used a moment ago that a lot of times we give you these specs and it's just a number. If you're not an active video practitioner, what does 120 frames a second mean? Well, here's a quick example. You can buy this camera today at B&H 
and you can go right outside on 9th Avenue and do video just like that by just simply telling the system, hey, I want to record in HD at 120 frames a second. Done deal. Um, it's, it's, a, it's cool capability. This doesn't require a trip into video editing software to find a way to, to make it slow motion, if you will. Another feature that we've added is what we call HDR video, if you're working in the full HD setting recording video. And what this is going to do, basically so you understand what's happening, is it'll shoot the video at 60 frames a second. And what it does is every other frame, it alternates standard exposure, darker exposure, standard exposure, darker exposure. Then it processes it in camera into a finished 30 frame a second video with added information in your highlights. And rather than show you, you know, two videos side by side or whatever, I'll just show you the a couple of frame grabs uh, from the first shot in two videos that we shot, in, in essence, one right after the other. And you can see in the video on the right, and again, the, the monitors here in, at, that we're working with are a little bit contrasty, but you can see you got more in the way of highlight detail in this than you do on the one shot just at standard settings. So the HD vi HDR video, uh, we understand that there, there are certainly more extensive effects that professionals and serious enthusiasts can apply in video editing software to produce HDR-like capability. But, you know, if you're in a situation, bright, sunny day, and you just know, hey, I got to get a quick video clip of this, and you're saying, oh, my God, the highlights here are bright, they're, they're about to burn out, and the shadows are just inky black, what am I going to do? Just simply being able to go into the HDR video and just be able to quickly record full HD video this way is actually kind of neat. Now, the one trick with it is you may not know where to get to it. And this actually happened to me where I just went into the video shooting menu and it's like, where the heck is it? What you need to do is have the camera set to record full HD video, 120, uh, rather uh, uh, 1080p video at 30 frames a second. You got to just go into your regular menu and set that. And then tell it just activate video. You got the video screen up. And what you want to do is either press the Q button, the quick control button, or there's a little Q icon on the touch screen. Push that and then the option for, among other things, the options for HDR off, HDR on appear. Uh, so it's through the quick control menu when you're set for video that you get it. Again, you got to be preset to shoot full HD video. If you've got it set for 4K or, or, or regular HD or whatever, it doesn't appear. At 30. At 30. Now, another capability on the video side, and this is something that if you're a still image shooter and you've been kind of holding your nose up to this point, uh, you may suddenly want to perk up and uh, take a listen. And that's the ability that if we're working, shooting video in 4K, the high resolution 4K video, we can do 4K frame grabs in the camera. We can shoot video, and then we can play it back, and we can select one or more frames from that video, and right on the screen, we can tell the system, hey, take this frame and write a new still image onto the memory card. Now. A lot of times when we think about frame grabs, we think about video, we think about taking it from video that's been shot for video purposes. And one of the things that I know when I was first getting my feet wet with this was a little hard to understand. As a still image shooter, I'm sort of, for, for decades, I've been thinking that, oh, when we shoot imagery, we want to use fast shutter speeds generally when we're outdoors to freeze motion and that kind of thing. Video users know better that when you're recording real video, normally, whenever possible, you want to be working at slower shutter speeds, a 60th of a second, a 30th of a second, maybe 125th. You don't normally want to go higher than that if you can help it, so that the video has a smooth, flowing look to any motion that's in it, whether we're shooting sports or whether we're just recording an interview. So we've been conditioned to think, okay, well, if we do a frame grab, it's going to be this blurry shot at a 30th of a second that, okay, if it's, you know, if it's that shot of Elvis coming out of a UFO or something, then, okay, maybe there'll be use for it. But otherwise, it's like, what, what, why would we care? But think about this as a still photographer for a moment, and think about the 4K frame grab as a still imaging tool. We got a camera here that when we're shooting normal full resolution pictures, 30 million pixels, we can shoot up to seven frames a second 
for many of us, that's plenty fast. But when we're shooting 4K video, we can shoot up to 30 frames a second. If you preset your exposure settings, your aperture, your ISO, your shutter speed, to give you sharp imagery in 4K video, you know, thousandth of a second at f4, or whatever the situations dictate, you can now grab good, sharp frames from that. They'd be 8.8 .8 million pixel frames, and it's recorded, it's all done right in the camera. Now, I got a couple of prints up here. I realize that our room is darkened, and I realize that our online viewers aren't going to be able to really sense this, but I got a couple of prints up here that we shot at Canon's national sales meeting last week that were 4K frame grabs. I'm going to ask you to just sort of take a look at these and pass them around. You can pass them through to the back of the room. You guys can take a look at this one. These are 8.8 .8 million pixel images. Now, obviously, you don't have quite the detail that you'd have if we had shot these at the full 30 million pixel resolution. But I know a lot of cynics out there are saying, oh, well, a 4K frame grab is only 8.8 .8 million pixels. How good is that? That might be fine for a, a Facebook picture or something, but how good could that be? Well, you know, you take a look at these prints, which are pretty big, and you can get a sense that this is, even at 8.8 .8 million pixels, these are high quality images. As long as you've done your work in terms of setting appropriate shutter speeds, lens apertures, ISOs for the lighting and for still image work, this could be a cool tool. So keep it in mind. Yet another video thing we've added, vid, not video thing, another video feature we've added, uh, apologize for the slip, uh, is the ability in the camera to do a time lapse video where we can basically shoot up to 3,600 frames. We can do it at intervals between frames, anywhere from a second up to almost 100 hours. Again, 99 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds between frames. And we can create, in the camera, a finished time-lapse video up to two minutes long. And in fact, if we're set for the PAL video setting, if we're working for the overseas video standards, it could actually be a little longer for technical reasons. Once again, seeing is believing. I'll show you a quick time-lapse video. You've all seen these kinds of videos before, I realize that, but the ability, once again, to be able to do it in the camera. You don't have to go to a high-end video editing program to do this. You don't have to take hundreds of still JPEG images, bring them into a video editing program, and now produce a time-lapse movie. You still could do that if you wanted to, but you got the ability on the fly to do stuff like this. And I mean, you know, again, it used to be that to do that kind of stuff required some work. Now, you can do it in the camera. As we wind down, I want to talk about basically, you know, some of you in the room may, and some of you who are watching online may well have already invested in an EOS 5D Mark IV. You're getting to know the camera, and hopefully some of the information we've given you up to now uh, has given you some insight into some of the, oh, thank you very much. You sat on the table has given you insight into some of the capabilities that you have and some of the ways you can leverage some of the features that are built into the camera. But I know for many of you, you're interested in the camera. It's got some obviously very appealing things, but you're working with something else. So let's talk about that. First off, in terms of just simply stepping up to the 5D Mark IV from earlier EOS models. And again, this could be stepping up from a 5D Mark III, certainly an earlier 5D, a 5D Classic, the original one, or a 5D Mark II. It could also mean stepping up from an older camera in the system, you know, a, a 70D or, you know, whatever. Talk about a few things. The transition is eased by a number of factors. First off, you're using the same memory cards. You're using, it has two card slots, a compact flash card slot and an SD memory card slot. So for really most applications, even cards you've had for several years for still imaging for sure will work fine. Uh, we have already cautioned users that if you do shoot 4K video, that is 
a very, very dense file and you will need high performance memory cards, either SD or CF, to be able to smoothly record 4K video. So just be aware of that. Those cards you've had in your bag for a couple, three years that have worked fine for shooting your still raw images and stuff may not work so fine for 4K video. But the point I'm making is we're not making you switch to new high speed cards. There, there'd be some desirable features for that for sure if we had, but the point is compatibility is maintained. The same is true on the battery packs. Uh, the, it uses the same LPE6 series batteries that we've used in our mid-range and high-end cameras for quite some time. So if you're coming from any version of the 5D, from many of our mid-range cameras, a, a, a 60D, a 70D, anything like that, you're using the same batteries, same chargers. Uh, you, we get this question occasionally. What about my speed lights? I work with not just a single speed light on the camera, but I, I maybe I've invested in the 600EX series speed lights with the, the radio-based wireless system. It is totally compatible with that. There are no, to be honest, no new features or enhancements. Everything you've known about that system will work the same with this with the 5D Mark IV. So absolutely nothing you have to change there. And the same applies for using older wireless flash technology, if you're using the, the 580s or whatever, and using the optical radio system, not radio, optical wireless system, works the same way. So again, no problems there. And the same is true with lenses. Uh, any, of our, any lens in our system other than an EFS lens, because they don't cover a full frame, uh, but any other lens in our system will work. So there's no restrictions on what lenses you can use, or you can only use new lenses or anything like that. So. What about if you're stepping up, what, what are the benefits if you're stepping up from an older APS-C sensor camera, a smaller sensor camera? And we could be talking to customers shooting with anything from a Rebel to a 7D series camera. What, what would be the benefits of stepping up? Well, first off, with the ability to shoot seven frames a second, you've got performance that exceeds most of our APS-C sensor cameras, except for the 7D series. Uh, as a full frame camera with a bigger imaging sensor and larger pixels, uh, you are definitely gonna get superior high ISO noise performance on a 5D Mark IV than you would have from an APS-C camera, especially as you go into the older ones back in time. 30 million pixels is going to exceed the pixel resolution of any of our APS-C smaller sensor cameras to date. Uh, so right off the bat, you're getting 50% more pixels or more depending on what camera you're shooting with than you currently are working with. And one of the things about going to full frame, this of course wouldn't be unique to the 5D Mark IV, but any full frame camera, uh, is that when it comes to wide angle lens choices, you're gonna have a lot more of them. We have a couple of great wide angle ultra wide zooms in the EFS system for our small chip cameras, for our 7D users, for our 80D, 70D, 60D and so on users, Rebel users, uh, that really are nice. But if you wanna go beyond that, in terms of you know, a fast fixed focal length, ultra wide lens or something, there really aren't a heck of a lot of choices. In full frame, there are. All the lenses, of course, act like, you know, on the wide angle side, act like wide angle lenses. Those of you who are 5D Mark III users, and let's face it, 5D Mark III was one of the greatest successes in the EOS system's history, in terms of its acceptance, in terms of really legitimizing the 5D as a professional tool, as well as a tool for the dedicated, serious enthusiast. It's been with us for four years now, and it'll continue to be with us for a while. Uh, 5D Mark III, nobody's got to apologize to me for shooting with a 5D Mark III. It's a great camera, proven capabilities, proven image qualities. What are you going to get stepping up to a 5D Mark IV? Well, one thing is, you're gonna get some improvements in image quality. Uh, you've got more resolution. You've got more ability to crop your images if you need to and still pull out good detail, especially if you need to make prints or something. You're gonna have a little bit less noise. Not, there's not a huge difference there for sure, but you're gonna have a little bit less noise. And definitely, we expect you're gonna get a little more tonal range as well. Now, I'll leave it to independent reviewers online and in print uh, to go over you know, the issues about comparing dynamic range and how much information can you lift from dark shadows and that kind of thing and how much noise is present. I'll leave it to third party viewers, to or reviewers, excuse me, to, to really give you folks the skinny on that. But just as we saw improvements compared to previous EOS products when we went to the 80D and the 1DX Mark II, 
with the new type of sensors. Uh, we expect similar kinds of improvements in tonal range and so on there. So compared to, a, again, comparing it to a 5D Mark III, or certainly earlier 5Ds, you're going to see some differences there that are under the heading of image quality. Mention the autofocus. If you work with tele-extenders, a lot of our photographers at the high end like to shoot wildlife and work with telephoto lenses and extenders. The ability now to focus anywhere on the screen if you have a version 3 Canon tele-extender and a compatible, a certain compatible lens. There's a list of lenses that'll give you the full, all 61 points, so it's not all of them. Uh, but the ability to have expanded capabilities at f8 uh, with autofocus is pretty neat. Uh, the dual pixel CMOS AF, you may never have shot live view before, but the dual pixel CMOS AF, when you play with it, it may give you a different spin on what live view is capable of. Uh, we mentioned the timers. You have built-in GPS capability. You have built-in Wi-Fi. Uh, I, this, this is kind of a humorous little anecdote. Uh, we just, as I mentioned, had our, at a sales meeting. It happened to be in Seattle last week. And I'd gotten a sample camera, and I brought it with me. And just for grins, I activated the GPS before I set out of my house to go to the airport and fly to Seattle. And just yesterday, I finally got around to looking at the GPS file on our map utility software. And it actually showed me driving to the airport, which wasn't a surprise. But then I kept the camera packed in a bag and up in the overhead compartment. It showed the entire flight path, <laughs> changing planes in Detroit and then going to Seattle. You could see it going all the way across the United States and then driving from the airport up to the hotel in downtown Seattle. It's cool. Um, seriously, you know, for people that, you know, that work doing nature work and that kind of thing, Certain types of stock image shooting where they may want to know precise location data or reasonably precise location data and so on. The built-in GPS is cool. It doesn't require you to go out and buy an accessory to get that. And just as an aside, so that you're aware, for technical reasons, because the GPS is built in, the optional <coughs> Canon GPE2 GPS adapter is not compatible with this camera. So if you own that GPE2 adapter that fits on the hot shoe, you can use it with other EOS cameras that it was compatible with, but it isn't compatible with this. It won't lay GPS information into this camera for technical reasons. We mentioned the metering system differences. If you're stepping up from an earlier 5D, the flash metering is going to be improved. You are going to get more consistent flat ETTL flash results, whether you're just working with a single speed light on the camera or whether you're working in a multiple flash system. The video capabilities, no question. Uh, it's just night and day, and keep in mind, the 5D series, starting with the 5D Mark II, is the camera that revolutionized digital SLR video to the industry. So we've taken some quantum leaps with this camera compared to our predecessors. Now, in terms of looking at the 5D Mark IV compared to other models that are in the current Canon lineup, I mentioned before, we've got right now currently available, disregarding older cameras that may still be in stock at dealers. We've got 11 different digital SLR models in the EOS line, uh, starting with our Rebel series up to the 1DX Mark II. So there's a lot of stuff that, a lot of choices for people and a lot of things this can be compared to. How does this fit in? One of the most compelling choices that a user has now, a serious enthusiast who's ready to make a switch, uh, a working professional, and so on, is comparing the, f the new 5D Mark IV to the high-resolution 5DS and 5DSR cameras. These are in the same 5D suit of clothes, but these are 50 million pixel cameras. So, obviously, in some ways, the 5DS and the 5DSR may speak even more strongly to you. You are obviously going to get more resolution and detail. We showed you before how you can make about a 22 by 15 inch print directly from a 5D Mark IV file without any enlargement of the file, and certainly you can enlarge it. Here, at 300 dpi, you can make almost a 20 by 30 inch print directly with no enlargement whatsoever of the file. And then, obviously, you can go beyond that enlarging it, whether it's in a print driver or in Photoshop or whatever. It gives you great cropping flexibility because it has so, these cameras have so much inherent detail. Again, talking about the 5DS and the 5DSR. They were designed with extra vibration resistance. 
starting with the base plate and the chassis of the camera, which are stronger than any other camera in our line, other than possibly an EOS 1DX series camera, uh, and with the mirror box as well to minimize vibration. Uh, so these are cameras that most assuredly are tripod friendly. They don't have the dual pixel autofocus, but they're, they're tripod friendly in a lot of ways. Bottom line is that a 5DS and 5DSR camera remain compelling choices for many of our customers, even in the presence of the 5D Mark IV that we're so excited about. If you rely on large printed output, if that's a big part of what you do, with a 5DS and a 5DSR, your ship has come in. And in particular, if you tend to work at relatively low ISOs, because there's an advantage with the 5D Mark IV there, and if you're working in situations where you normally can control your exposure and you're not going to have to worry about going into an image editing program or a raw processing program and trying to rescue detail from shadows or whatever, if that's not a big part of what you do, again, 5DS and 5DSR may be money well spent. It's a particularly compelling choice because if you look at the current pricing, obviously many of you are going to be shopping at different retailers, so I'm not going to quote exact numbers. But the price that we're starting out with with the 5D Mark IV compared to the 50 million pixel 5DS and 5DSR is not a heck of a lot of difference. So it's, an, it's a very interesting choice. And these are, keep in mind, these are cameras that are a year old, talking about the 5DS and 5DSR. So it's not like we're talking about something that's you know, you know, old technology that's about to, you know, we're going to see a new camera in six months or something. No, no, no. These are absolutely current products. So. With all that as a background, why consider the new 5D Mark IV? It is going to give you superior performance in terms of noise at high ISOs, no question. It's going to give you more shooting speed, up to seven frames a second as opposed to up to five frames a second. That doesn't sound like a lot of difference, but this camera feels more brisk in your hands, talking about the 5D Mark IV. Um, so if you're shooting, you know, whether it's just portraits where you like to work quickly, you know, or, or fashion or something, if you're shooting things like birds in flight or even sports, no question, 5D Mark IV is a higher performance camera. It has that advantage of being able to autofocus with extenders at f8 over more of the focusing area and with certain lenses and extenders up to and including, as I've mentioned before, up to all 61 points. We don't have that on the 5DS and 5DSR. It's limited on f8 autofocus to just the center. Um, Video, night and day. If you shoot vid if you, if video is a part of your reasoning in terms of why you're thinking about stepping up, end of discussion right there. Go with a 5D Mark IV. Uh, the dual pixel CMOS autofocus for live view and for video, again, huge, huge benefit for the 5D Mark IV. We don't have that technology in the 5DS and 5DSR. And we mentioned, uh, you know, already the, the fact that, you know, we expect and I'll, again, leave it to independent reviewers to quantify, we expect that you're going to get more tonal range out of 5D Mark IV files. Not more detail in terms of just fine detail and so on, but in terms of shadow detail, highlight detail, that kind of thing, we expect a little bit of an edge there. And it's at least initially a little bit less expensive. So that, that choice right there is an interesting one. How about if you're using a 7D Mark II? Very strong and important camera in our lineup right now. And if you're either considering stepping up to this or you already own one, uh, you know, what, how does a 5D Mark IV compare to that? You get more speed, certainly, with the 7D Mark II. That'll shoot up to 10 frames a second. The autofocusing system is different. It's a 65-point system that covers more of the image area, more of the, of the viewfinder, because it's an APS-C sensor camera. It's a small sensor camera. 7D is not a full-frame camera, of course. Um, and for technical reasons, this is an interesting one, you're going to get cross-type autofocus coverage when you're shooting through the viewfinder with more lenses with a 7D than you will with a camera like the 5D Mark IV, any of the 5D series, or a 1DX. Uh, it's, you get benefits on the 5D Mark IV and 1DX side in terms of high precision with fast lenses. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're working with more you know, modest aperture lenses, like you know, 100 to 400s and that kind of thing, 
you can certainly do great work with those with a 5D Mark IV, don't get me wrong. Uh, but on paper, you actually have an autofocus advantage in some ways with a camera like a 7D Mark II. And you do a slightly faster flash sync as well. It'll sync up to a 250th, the 5D series syncs at a 200th. No question, in the EOS line right now, the 7D Mark II is the performance value in our system. When you look at the performance you get in a 7D Mark II for the money that it costs to buy one of these new, it is, you know, with big underscores, the performance value in our system. If a Canon customer comes to us saying, I, I want to start, you know, really getting serious about shooting sports, maybe they're, you know, shooting, you know, high school or college sports or something, I want to get, you know, I want to really start, you know, working with birds in flight and that kind of thing. Um, a 7D Mark II for the money is a mighty compelling choice. And that's especially the case if making big printed output, I'm talking, you know, things like two by three foot prints and larger for display purposes, and if shooting in super low light and expecting like almost no noise, if those two things are not big on your radar screen, once again, big check marks for a 7D Mark II. And then, you know, it's real easy for us to tout the advantages of a full frame sensor, you know, the, the image quality advantages and so on. Uh, but an APS-C sensor, the crops, the smaller sensor cameras, actually have a couple of things going in their favor. And one of them is if you shoot a lot of telephoto, your lens, of course, acts more powerful in effect than it would if you put it on a full frame camera. Uh, a lens like that 100 to 400 millimeter zoom, for instance, which is such a wonderful lens for wildlife work and a million other things for outdoor shooting, that effectively becomes a 160 to about 640 millimeter lens, if I remember the math, uh, in terms of the area covered when you shoot with it on a camera like a 7D. So it suddenly becomes a 600 millimeter plus lens that you can hand hold. And you're not really going to be able to do that with a full frame camera. On the flip side, you obviously have limits in terms of how many wide angle lens choices you have. We can get you a wide, an ultra wide angle zoom that acts like a 16 to 35. So you can get ultra wide coverage, but you're not gonna have tons of different lens choices that'll give you ultra wide coverage. So again, looking at a 7D Mark II, if you're thinking about which one would be better for me or whatever, the 5D Mark IV obviously still has its own advantages. It is a full frame sensor, and that means you're gonna have less high ISO noise. The focusing system makes up for not having cross type coverage with slow lenses throughout the whole array by giving you higher precision AF when you slap on a 2.8 lens, for instance, or something. I mentioned the advantage of the F8 capability. You got the touch screen interface, which we don't have on the 7D Mark II. It has 4K video. Now, the, four, the video capabilities on a 7D Mark II are actually pretty good, but it doesn't have 4K, and it doesn't have touchscreen, nor does it have 120 frame cap slow motion capability like I showed you earlier. And finally, uh, the 7D Mark II does not have built-in Wi-Fi, whereas we do on the 5D Mark IV. Similarly, if we look at the EOS 6D, this is the lightest, smallest and most affordable full frame camera in the EOS lineup. And no question, this as I said, there's no question that the 7D Mark II is the performance value in our system when you look at what you get and bang for the buck. In terms of image quality and bang for the buck, how much are you spending for the camera body versus what you're getting, this is the image quality champion in terms of value. And you do get Wi-Fi and GPS built in, which is kind of convenient too, on an EOS 6D. So, you know, for somebody that said, you know, I, the budget's a little tight right now. I didn't get the, the tax refund I was hoping for from Uncle Sam this year, uh, but I really would like to invest in a camera. Somebody that says, for instance, I'm doing a lot of landscape work and I really like to invest in something that'll give me good image quality, um, but I don't have, you know, over $3,000 to invest in a camera. EOS 6D is all of a sudden a mighty, mighty interesting choice uh, for that kind of user. Doesn't give you the performance that you get in some of our other cameras in terms of frames per second and that kind of thing. But if you're working at a little bit slower pace doing studio work, portraits, landscape is an obvious one. For the money, you can't beat it with a stick. Still, obviously, with a 5D Mark IV, if you can make that investment and you're comparing the two, 
what am I getting for the extra money I'm investing? 50% more pixel resolution. It'll definitely shoot faster. The autofocus system in terms of shooting through the viewfinder, night and day. I mean, I'll be perfectly frank. The focusing system in the 6D is nothing special. It'll work, but it's, it's nowhere near what you get with a 5D Mark IV. The dual pixel CMOS autofocus when we're working live view or video, you don't have that in the 6D. Uh, the touchscreen interface, which is so cool. And again, I urge you to either come to me afterwards or certainly my colleague who's working right outside the room, for those of you who are in the building today, uh, check out the touchscreen interface. It's, it's one of those things that I could sit here and talk about it, but it makes a heck of a lot more sense when you just play with it in your hand. Um, the 4K video and so on. And then finally, real quick, now some people may say, well, this is a silly comparison to compare it to the top of the line camera in our line, the EOS 1DX Mark II. It's like almost twice as much money talking about the 1DX Mark II. But if, we, if you just look and, okay, how does the 5D Mark IV stack up against it? If you just start comparing things in a general sense. The 1DX Mark II is without question the performance leader in our camera line. It's not necessarily the performance value in terms of how much, you know, the money invested. But it's, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can invest in this camera, you're getting the best performing camera we have ever produced. And arguably one of the top performing cameras in the world. And it's, in addition to the performance, it's going to give you the highest levels of strength, weather resistance, durability, and so on. Another thing, and this is one of these things that you don't see in the specs, but if you work with a 1DX and then any of our other cameras, including the 5D series, which are great, you really come to, you really come to appreciate, if you know your cameras, you appreciate what a great viewfinder it has. It's big, it's bright, it's contrasty. Uh, it is great. You realize what a real professional camera is all about. This is a bit of a strained analogy, but in that regard, and some others, it's a little like people who know their way around cars, riding in an ordinary passenger sedan, nice car, and then getting into a, a really high-end luxury car. You can just, you can tell there are differences. Doesn't mean that everybody should be driving a high-end luxury car, but there are differences. Okay, kind of the same thing here. And then finally, this is going to be the high ISO champ in our, in our lineup. If you are looking at how, what level of noise do I get at higher ISOs, if I got to work in low light, this is the best one we make. The others are good. This is the best. But again, 5D Mark IV still has some very, very, I'll use the word again, compelling reasons to consider it. Once again, you get about 50% more pixel resolution. You're talking 30 million pixels versus about 20 million pixels. You got the digital lens optimizer technology built into the camera for your JPEG images, which takes even more advantage of those pixels. Uh, obviously, significantly smaller, lighter, and quieter. If you're doing things like wedding work and other work where you, from time to time, kind of need to blend into the scenery, a, a 1DX, for all the great things I can say about it, is going to make you work because it is it, the high energy shutter to get those speeds out of it. There's a lot of collision force and it makes noise. Uh, I'm not saying a 5D Mark IV is totally silent, but it's a lot quieter. Um, the 5D Mark IV has the full touchscreen interface. We have limited touchscreen capability on the 1DX Mark II. The 5D Mark IV has full touchscreen capability for almost anything. And again, price, I, that goes without saying. Uh, it's just a little more than half the price at the time of its introduction compared to a 1DX Mark II. So, to kind of wrap things up, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you folks may have, and we can look at a couple of things and so on. And I got one little treat as well that I want to talk about, but I'll, I'll summarize the camera first. The fact is, most of us probably shoot more than one type of subject. You know, most of us are not one-trick ponies. We, you know, we may do a variety of different types of work for fun, for pleasure, for our business, for our livelihood, or whatever. You know, but whether we shoot things like portraits or fashion or whatever, we know that the 5D series, the full-frame 5D series, has always had a great reputation among our serious enthusiasts and our working professionals. But with the 5D Mark IV, we've got even more performance, more than we've ever had in the 5D series. 
meaning this camera is even more ready to go for different types of assignments than anything else wearing a 5D suit of clothes. And even higher image quality uh, than the older 5D series. Obviously, with the 5DS and 5DSR, you can argue that the higher resolution may win out for some uses. But when you talk about the totality of image quality, high ISO noise, uh, what we expect in terms of tonal range and so on, this thing is a champ. Uh, and we can you know, conclude by saying that the 5D Mark IV is arguably the most versatile EOS digital SLR to date. When you look at the image quality factor, the performance factor, the, just the size and weight of it, the cost and so on, this really is like a Swiss Army knife. Uh, it can be used in so many different applications and work well in them. We are really, really excited about the possibility this offers to our customers. Now, the little surprise I wanted to mention to you is that we recently also introduced, announced, I should say, three new lenses that are going to be of interest to, I think, a lot of our customers. Uh, we introduced a new 24 to 105 millimeter F4 L series IS lens, a version 2 lens. I have it right here. You can take a look at it. We introduced a new 16 to 35 f2.8 L version 3 lens. This is it right here. You can come take a look at it. And we just got done announcing a new 70 to 300 millimeter zoom, a lower price lens, not an L-series lens, but one we expect to have excellent performance with a nano USM focusing motor, so it's really brisk on the focusing and silent and a very innovative LCD panel on the lens to give us our distance information, or we can change that to show uh, the lens focal length, and it'll actually do the conversion if you're working with a small chip camera to tell you where you're zoomed, and it can also be changed to show the amount of shake that it's detecting. It's an IS lens, so it obviously will correct for that. And you change those by just pushing the mode button on the side of the lens. So I have those three lenses up here as well. Just for comparison's sake, I did bring an EOS 5D Mark III up here as well. Obviously, many of you know this camera and love it, but if you just wanted to compare them side by side, I've got that as well. So with that, I want to thank you folks for joining us. I want to thank our online audience for sure, and I certainly want to thank our folks who are in attendance today. We're going to wrap things up for the folks who are uh, watching us online. Uh, I want to thank you folks sincerely, both you know, the people that attended today for sure, uh, and everybody who's watching us online for being with us. We hope that this has been beneficial information for you on the 5D Mark IV. Uh, and certainly, we want to thank B&H for giving us this opportunity to talk about the camera and beyond that for B&H's commitment to customer education here at the event space. So thank you very much, but I want to thank B&H. Let's give a hand to B&H too. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.